moving over to Soul Heart. So I did want to comment on something musically about it. When I first heard it, it, it did okay with me. I haven't been, to be honest, a huge fan lyrically of Ed Goldfarb's, uh, like I said, lyrical work. I think he's a better arranger and composer than he is a lyricist, to be perfectly honest there. But just listening to this musically, I, I eventually, it just kept nagging me that this sounds kind of familiar. And it eventually <laughs> hit me that the, the main riff of this bears a somewhat loose but noticeable resemblance to the song Memories from the musical Cats by Andrew Lloyd Webber, which is just kind of an odd thing. It's not similar enough that I think the Pokemon Company is going to get any sort of legal trouble, but if you play them side by side, uh, the, the, the song Memories from Cats goes in a lot of different places, but there is that one little passage that sounds kind of similar between the two, and not sure how intentional that was, or if that's just, you know, when you have a certain limited set of things to work with, or in, in, as you sometimes do in music or whatever. But I did kind of want to mention that, and I'm not sure if that makes me like it more or less. We've talked about other times where songs have had similarities to other works or to art artists um, out there. But I did kind of want to start off by mentioning that. As far as the lyrics, I think it follows pretty closely. It sounds like it's being told from McGearna's perspective about how she, or I should say how it, it, it does obviously have a very female appearance, but like most legendary Pokemon, it is an it. How it sort of came to be, and sort of its effect, and uh, sort of how its life has played out. Uh, does that sound about right to you, uh, Anne? Yeah, like I was a, a little surprised at how very specifically, it seemed to tie into Magirna and what it might have been feeling throughout the course of the movie. Because unlike uh, Vulcanian, uh, Magirna doesn't really say anything. It has some, you know, oh, chirp is maybe not the right word, but some little sounds it makes to sort of show approval or, or disagreement or sadness or whatever it happens to be feeling at the time. But uh, ha so having a song by uh, from its perspective is is kind of interesting. It is basically a retelling of some of the main features of the movie. And did you have any other comments on uh, the lyrics there? Well, the first two stanzas kind of really stuck out to me. It, again, just it was that moment where I was like, "Oh wow, this is very specifically about the movie." Like you know the the talking about being Forge of Steel and and driving men apart, the forgotten plane. Like just, it kind of took me into a different world because I didn't expect to get inside Magirna's head after an entire movie where it didn't have a voice that the audience heard in that way. And so being in that sense of like, this is Magirna singing and this is, this is everything Magirna's feeling kind of made the ending of the song like, you know, let me be your guiding light. Um, anyone seeking a new start, like, let me be your shining star started to give the movie a bit more meaning and resonance. And, and again, maybe kind of contribute to why I still kind of have positive feelings about it, despite it being all over the place. I don't know, I started picking out little things about the movie that worked really well for me individually, because the first couple stanzas were so character and, and like specific to the movie. And I just thought that was very interesting. Yeah, it's definitely something that we haven't seen as much in, in sort of the recent movies where it yeah. sort of, you know, nails on to there where you can totally tell. I mean, there's nothing explicit and there's no mention of Pokemon anywhere in the song, but listening to it and having seen this movie, you totally connect those. Uh, you can tell it is, it is for this movie, um, almost in, in kind of a way that I guess you could say, Going way back, all the way to the English version of the first movie, We're a Miracle, kind of is like that too, except, of course, We're a Miracle, not written for the movie, whereas this almost certainly was. But yeah, like in that sense of like, you're listening to We're a Miracle and you're like, is it actually quoting the script? Like, you're so surprised it's not written for the movie. This is kind of that same thing. It's like, I mean, I, I guess it could have resonance in other contexts, but it is so tied to this one context and this one character that you you feel very connected because of it. Do you think this is something they should try more often? 
I enjoy it. I, I enjoy when the music tied to a film, whether because you picked it for a specific reason or because you crafted it specifically for a situation. Like I like when it when the entire project connects. So I, I would love to see more of this sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think it is certainly possible to go too close to the source material if you do it the wrong way. Um, it's hard for me to come up with an exact example about that. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. Like, I, I do think that since we have had a bit of a departure from that, especially on the Japanese side with them kind of commissioning out of house, I would kind of like to see a period where we got a bit back more in house. Like each project was its own contained thing. I, I don't know. I just think they could do some really interesting things with that for a couple years. <laughs> that is kind of the interesting sort of like reverse parallel between the dub and the Japanese side. The Japanese side started contracting out more and more. Mm -hmm. And the English side has since about, well, really since movie three or four has done virtually everything internally which produces somewhat of a different result in each case. And, and we mentioned earlier that because the dub comes out a few months later, they may have access. We do know that, for example, uh, episodes of the show are often dubbed before they've actually aired in Japan. So they're, they're far enough ahead that they have that kind of thing. So that may also be an asset when writing music is that they, they may be able to clue in on things a little bit more easily. Mm-hmm. But going back to sort of the, the cats analogy, I did want to say, as far as the, the voice of this, I bet Danny Marcus, I assume she's from the New York City area, I don't know how much, if any, Broadway experience she has, but she sounds like she could do a pretty good job on uh, a number of uh, musicals there. I, I'd go see her. I think she'd kill it. Uh, definitely a very talented singer, and uh, I'd be interested to know if she has any other work out there. I haven't really looked for it, uh, but I'm not explicitly aware of anything either. Yeah, I'm not uh, either. Yeah, she certainly has the voice to do whatever she wants in life. So, <laughs> like, I've been very impressed. All right. Well, you know, since we haven't had these around as long, maybe we don't have uh, as much to say about them. And, you know, our opinions may even change over time. We might do a revisit at some point. But, um,. You know, if you had to pick one of these m songs to kind of, you know, be the better symbol of the movie, do you have a particular feeling there, Anne? Well, you know, I think I'm going to go with Soul Heart this time. Um, and as you say, like, our opinions might change over time, but as, as it stands now, Soul Heart seems to fit the movie specifically, which is always like, you know, my trump card whenever the songs are a tie. And it is a sound that is more pleasing to my ears. Like, like Yuki is very talented in the genre of music that she does and the style of singing she does. As I mentioned, like she, her contribution to the music scene in Japan in the 90s cannot be denied, but it is not a sound that I specifically love myself. So I think on both counts, Soul Heart works for me a little better. But like I do love her lyric writing so much, Yuki's. So it, it's kind of a tough to let it go. <laughs> but I would kind of give the edge to Soul Heart. I do think, though, going along with our previous discussion, that they probably could have taken it even further with a bit longer of a mix and maybe thrown in some more. E even with the, the movie being what it is, which, like I said, is not one of my favorite Pokemon movies, certainly. I think they could have probably gone deeper and maybe made some more acute observations there, like I said, even with the movie being what it is. Mm. And uh, I would have liked to see that. But that being said, yeah, I kind of gotta give Soul Heart the edge. Neither of these are, you know, I don't think uh, Mailing Out My Voice is a terrible song in any sort of way. It does have some neat things in it. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I, I think the sort of thing here we came up with is that when we just were discussing before we recorded this is that we're kind of lukewarm on on both of these songs. Neither of them is terrible. I don't know that any of either of them is going to have a super lasting appeal either. I think in the grand uh, scheme of Pokemon ending songs, I think these are both sort of going to at some point kind of fall by the wayside as kind of a footnote, uh, maybe Soul Heart a little less so. 
But um, that's that's sort of my opinion there. I, I, I would pick Soul Heart above mailing out my voice. They both have good things. Neither of them is terribly offensive. No, neither of them is going to be on my top five list of Pokemon movie ending themes ever. So, I would agree with that. Like uh, mailing out my voice has so many interesting things and e- interesting lyrics, but it doesn't capture me in the same way that say Mama or Becky Mono does for me, or it, it doesn't like, give the same like Pokemon. Like instantly you recall that movie to memory that together with the wind does. So it's it's just, it's just a good song. And when you're putting together your ultimate Pokemon playlist, just a good song kind of doesn't cut it. (laughs) I suppose. And I I think you mentioned that you sort of use this as a tiebreaker, which one relates closer to the movie if you can't make a decision otherwise. To be honest, I think that actually may work in Soul Heart's favor to sort of help the person kind of remember, because I think this this movie is not a complete mess, but kind of a bit of a jumble <laughs> in places. This is true. <laughs> Well, with that said, let's talk about some of the other music in this movie. There's no short, not even in Japan, uh, for this one. Yeah. But, uh, of course, there's a score. Now, because this is the first time we've covered an X and Y movies, one one thing they'd started doing with this generation is that a lot of the score is replaced. Basically, what they end up keeping from the Japanese side in the dub are most of the game-related stuff. So there are some things that come from the actual vi- video games, like the uh, Welcome to the World of Pokemon, and I think they keep Clements like uh, Future is Now, Thanks to Science uh, theme there, and one or two other things there. But the rest of it is 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 sort of replaced. I'm not sure if I have a super huge opinion I, I, about the score on either side. I did listen to the Japanese score album, and knowing how the movie is structured, I sort of pieced things together there. I do think that, kind of like the movie, the score is a bit all over the place. There's a lot of different styles, and they don't seem to mesh as well when you listen to it like in a straight shot as, say, when we were talking about the fifth movie, where there's a couple distinct styles there, but they seem to work more cohesively. And did you sort of come to the same conclusion there? I agree. Like, overall, the score didn't, like, impact me very much at all. Like, I barely remember. But I do remember thinking, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of fun little interludes for, like, the comic relief scenes. And then there's, you know, some more orchestral or dramatic moments for the more the dramatic moments. But you don't feel a sense of cohesion and none of it is particularly striking in its separateness either. Like it is not like a particular melody popped out or, or particular musical cue popped out. And I was like, well, that doesn't fit with the rest of the movie, but it is really cool. Like it was just lukewarm all around. So yeah. (laughs) I will say that, um, you know, one of the, the things I've said in previous episodes is that I haven't been super bothered by with the X and Y movies and them replacing a lot of the score elements. They would do that occasionally before, usually when the Japanese ending theme song was used and they use a different ending theme song, so they had to swap that out. But one of my criticisms of the last couple Japanese scores is that I don't think they had... They weren't super memorable on their own. This one, I think, does a little better. I think the compositions on the Japanese side are a little bit better better. I think the playing, actually, the uh, people doing the instruments in the orchestra or, or whatever else seem to have a little more feeling in there. So that's that's good, but it's still, I think, like I said, has that same problem as the movie, where it is a little bit disjointed. And uh, the English score, I'd have to listen to the movie really closely, uh, because it's not a separate recording for me to listen to on that one. It's a little more difficult for me to say much. I've been okay with some of the replacements over the last few years. I've actually had a couple of those that have struck me as, well, that was really pretty neat, actually. Um, so I, I can see people not liking the replacement. I can see people like myself being okay with it. So it's it's sort of a how-do-you-want-to-take-it type of deal there. Yeah, true as well that we're not as familiar with this particular movie. And I think since the movie in so many ways is not you know, a straight hit out of the park. If we're going to appreciate it, it's going to be through time, I think. (laughs) Quite possibly, yes. 
The other thing we should probably mention is that each of these versions has uh, a variant of the opening theme for their respective region. Of course, the Japanese one has uh, a special movie version of X, Y, and Z. The American one, or the English one, has Stand Tall as the official name of the third season of X and Y's theme. There's also, later in the movie, there's kind of an instrumental version of each uh, near towards the end. I haven't, like I said, as far as the uh, opening theme for X and Y, they have original lyrics. I haven't been as fond of those on the English side. Uh, as far as the Japanese one, I'm I'm more or less okay with X, Y, and Z. Uh, the ending to that song doesn't really do it for me. Uh, it doesn't sound like it, you know, since I don't know much Japanese, maybe it makes more sense if you could, but... The, the Iku Z pun is pretty stellar, I think, but... <laughs> Other than that, I have no thoughts. <laughs> totally over my head. <laughs> so so there's definitely that. Um, but like we said, no short. So we don't have much to discuss there. But um, yeah, so we'll have to kind of see. We may revisit this once we get to the XY generation or the Sun Moon generation uh, in this series in a year or so. Um <laughs> is about how long it's going to take if we keep doing these <laughs> once a month and depending on how many special episodes we do. But I think for now, that's going to wrap it up for uh, Volcanion and the uh, Mechanical Marvel. But anyway, going on to what will be our next episode in about a month or so, we will be discussing Movie 6, um, Jirachi Wishmaker, or Wishing Star of Seven Nights. So this one, we've sort of been teasing for a while. It is obviously going to be different because the dub song, it's not a translation. Uh, the lyrics don't really have much to do with each other between the two versions. However, it is the same underlying melody, and the they do a sort of a combo version for the English end credits, where it's part of the Japanese version of the song and also a new English lyric version of it. I think we're going to have a lot to say about that, as well as the short. Um, it's, like I said, going to be a little bit of a different structure, because the short also uses the same underlying tune. But uh, definitely looking forward to that discussion anyway. So uh, thank you very much, and been great having you on. Oh, thank you for having me. This has been Stephen Reich from the Pelican Press Studios in Madison, Wisconsin. On the phone with Anne, discussing the Japanese and English ending themes of the Magirna movie.